We all know that ABA is data-driven and evidence-based. Uh, the seven dimensions of ABA are the core principles that ensure effectiveness in each treatment plan. Um, as BCBAs, we have had to memorize the seven dimensions of ABA for our exam, uh, but who remembers those seven dimensions and how can we apply them to our ABA programs? Hi, I'm Shira. And I'm Shana. We are behavior analysts who create weekly content about how to teach kids with autism so that they make real progress. And we create shareable resources to make your job just a little easier. Today's topic is all about the seven dimensions of ABA. And if you want more videos like this, make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay updated on new video releases. Most organizations, probably all organizations, have a mission statement, right? They have values. It's really about getting people to work towards a common goal. In ABA, I feel like the seven dimensions are our mission statement, our value statement, right? Like we take data on things, we analyze the data, we need to make sure that, you know, what we're putting in place is working. So if we want to think about the seven dimensions in a little bit of a different way, it's not just something we have to memorize in graduate school, but it's actually because this is really our mission statement as ABA therapists. Right, it's how we should be making our decisions. In every step along the way, we need to be applying these seven dimensions to everything. It's not just one thing or it's a, not a technical thing. It's kind of the underlying value system of when we're choosing goals, when we're um, doing assessments, when we're analyzing data. Uh, it's almost like a constant underlying foundation of everything that we do. So while we memorized them many years ago, we are going to review them and keep talking about them because they are so important. What are those seven dimensions? Let's say it without further ado. So one of them is applied. Um, what does that mean? Really applied? Really, you want to think about socially significant things. I think this is my favorite. It really is. I, I, as kind of as an aside, I went to school, I did my undergraduate degree in behavioral psychology, and we learned about pigeons punching buttons and rats going through mazes and that kind of thing. And I remember raising my hand and saying to my professor, like, okay, this is great. I can, you know, get a pigeon to touch green and not red. And I know what the schedule of reinforcement is, but how does this relate to real life? And my prof kind of looked at me and goes, well, I don't know, but this is what I'm teaching. And I mean, he's in experimental behavioral psychology. And it was really frustrating to me that he didn't really think of or couldn't think of many examples in the applied setting. And Funny enough, I went back to him after I graduated and after I was in the field and I needed a letter of reference for him for graduate studies. And I told him what I was doing and probably for another two or three years, he kept referring students to me who were asking those same questions like, what is applied behavioral analysis? Um, so this yes. probably is one of my favorite you know, ones of all of the seven dimensions is the applied piece. But also because um, we've all experienced that. Like we went to school and learned things that really don't matter. And I remember asking the teacher, like, when are we ever going to need to do these kind of math equations in our lives ever? And her answer was probably something like, well, you're not gonna have a calculator everywhere you go. So you will need it. Yeah, we and do. here we are <laughs> not ever needing to figure out, you know, how much money we're going to need at the checkout. So it really applies to so many things, which is what I like about, about ABA is that it, there's so much real life about it. And it's not exclusive to like special needs or to autism or to a lot of the populations that we work with. But the good teaching that we're talking about in ABA really applies to all of the, all of us and all of the things that we're learning. I also love that the applied section really talks about individualized ABA, right? It's individualized treatment and intervention plans because it's not about, okay, I've got this assessment and I need to fill in these boxes. And if this learner doesn't have these boxes, I need to put these ones in place because we really shouldn't have cookie cutter programs for the individuals we're working with. So really think about applied being socially significant, but also being individualized to the learner. Yeah, with our goal being that we want to help them um, most in their lives, what's well, going to give them the most independence and the most quality of life in the long term. Um, we've put together our opinion on what some of the top must have, you know, ABA programs would be to create a good, like well-rounded program um, in a way that individualizes that to the learner and that thinks about all of those different applied skills that they might need in the future. So go check that out.
So the next dimension is behavioral. And what is behavioral? Um, really what it talks about is that, you know, the behaviors that we address in treatment plans, they have to be observable and measurable. I think it was um, Ogden Lindsley who said, I'm trying to think of the name, Ogden Lindsley was the one who said, uh, if a dead man can do it, it's not behavior. Um, so we really wanna make sure that all behavior is observable and measurable. You know, in the last few years, we've been talking about, you know, different feelings of anxiety and anger and that type of thing. And, you know, Skinner talks about, you know, those inside, those private events still being behavior, but somehow we need to make them observable and measurable. So anxiety in a way that's observable, measurable could be, that, you know, it could be red ears or it could be the way, you know, learners are wringing their fingers. It could be different things, but as long as you can observe them, then you can measure them. But also a private event would fall into this category because if they can report on them or if someone can label a private event um, or in some way it does change a behavior that's observable and measurable. Like if you say, I'm afraid, so I won't go outside, you know, it's, that's observable and measurable. So there's a lot of ways to include um, all things that you can see, but also that a learner can think and feel into the behavioral um, dimension. So when you think about behavioral, keep thinking observable, measurable, observable, measurable. But the reason being is because we really want that to translate into data, right? We need data on frequency, duration, uh, percentage correct, to show, so that we can show learners progress or lack of progress and then figure out how to solve that. Um, but we need that data to determine further intervention plans and you know further ways that we can help teach replacement behaviors. Well, you're getting ahead to the, the third Right, dimension. I really am, yes. <laughs> so we've done, so ABA, Applied Behavior and Analytic. So Applied Behavior Analysis, we're up to the third. Um, the analytic is using that data, um, looking at objective information to determine, is this working? Is this not working? It's not somebody's opinion. Um, it's not anecdotal, but we're really looking at hard data. Um, we use evidence-based procedures when we implement new techniques we're documenting with objective measures and data. And that's where behavioral and analytic really complement each other because you can only really take objective data on things that are more observable and measurable. The clearer defined that they are, the more objective the kind of data that you're going to get. And uh, what's that famous mean? Without behavior or without? Without data. Yes, thank you. Without data, it's just someone's opinion. Right. So that is the analytic dimension. Um, the next one is technological. And while I used to think this involved using technology, it is not. So it means I have to have my iPhone in session, right? <laughs> it has no, nothing no, to do with no. technology. Um, it means that when you're writing up any program or any intervention plan, it is written in a way that is detailed in technological terms. Uh, meaning that anybody could take that and it's broken down enough that they could take it and and do it and use it. If you think about like a recipe is technological because it's broken down and it's written out in a way that's clear so that anyone can take it and do it. I'm actually not sure why that is technological. I also think it's really funny because to me, like technological is a really big word. And A, you think technology, but B, you think big words, right? So you've got to have a program description that's very detailed in really technological terms. And technological terms really means actually non-technology terms, right? You need to make sure that this is readable for every single person who's reading this plan. And if that's parents, you want to make sure that it's in the simplest language possible so that it can be implemented and replicated. Yeah, you almost think about like technique or technical, meaning if somebody is reading this, will it help them be like technically do this correctly or will their technique be good? Um, and that's the way that we have to write things out so that it's being implemented in a very like technically correct way. Oh, that's a good analogy. That's a, yeah, that's a really high five on that one, Shira. <laughs> The next one is called uh, conceptually systematic. Um, this one, I, I never quite understood the depth of it. I think it just means that it's based on like core principles of ABA, that we're using research-based techniques. We're using things that are, that you can connect to ABA, like reinforcement, prompting, shaping, modeling. We're not like, you know, pulling um, techniques from nowhere. We're only using the things that are kind of related and connected to ABA. 
uh, really, I think we need to think about these seven dimensions as not operating as silos, right? It's not about, okay, I'm doing this, but I'm not doing this, or I'm doing, they all really interact with each other. So the conceptually systematic, yes, I'm using prompting, I'm using reinforcement, I'm using shaping, all of those terms, but then I'm also using data collection, and I'm analyzing it, and I'm applying it and everything else. So it really, they all really interact with each other. Um, another dimension is effective. And we all, as behavior analysts, go, uh, of course we need a Probably my second favorite. Yeah, right? Um, anyways, really it's about, you know, intervention techniques that are effective. They work, right? They have they to work. work. <laughs> they work. And how do we know that they work? We have collected data and we've analyzed the data. So again, it's not about just, you know, collecting data. It's about the analyzing. It's about, well, we know they're effective because we've done the analytic piece and we've used conceptually appropriate, you know, techniques and we've written them down. So it's technological. So it, they all really combine. Yeah. And if it's not effective, then we have to go back and reanalyze and think about what we could do to make this effective because yeah. it's so important. Um, the last one is, uh, generalizability. So it's that we can, when we're teaching a behavior, we're always thinking about how is this going to generalize? We're always considering the different environments that the learner is going to be in, that we're not just teaching things in a vacuum, that ABA does not happen in a very dry, sterile clinical setting, but it has to happen in a way that the student can apply it to their home, to their school life, to any other place that they're going to be. And that, that's on us in the way that we're teaching the skills in a way that the learner can generalize. And it's not just about generalization, but it's also about maintenance, right? So that they can sustain that new skill over time. So the generalization piece is across environments, across stimuli, across people, but also just sustaining what we've actually taught them over time. And that's really about the adept to generality piece for sure. And it's also back to what's meaningful and what's applied because they're gonna be more able to generalize a skill that is socially significant and that is meaningful. And I think about a classic example, and I think about, you know, something like teaching receptive labels. And yes, you can teach receptive labels to lots of people, but what are those first few receptive labels that you teach? Well, someone who lives on a farm and interacts with farm animals or farming tools on a regular basis, you know, the very first receptive labels I may teach, not the very first, but, you know, one of the first receptive labels I may teach are farm animals or those farming tools, right? For someone who lives in the city and has no interest in farm animals and isn't going to see farming tools on a regular basis, that's gonna be one of the last receptive labels that I teach. So really we wanna make sure that it's functional for our learners. For other things on what ABA is beyond what we talked about today, go check out our other podcast episode called What is ABA? For more information on the seven dimensions of ABA, click the link in and around this video or on the description to claim your free download on must-have ABA programs. We also encourage you to subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss any future videos and leave a like and comment below if you have further questions.